Hi, um, I'm here today to talk to uh, Amy, Amy Bleasbourne or Amy Moonwalker as you are today. Um, Amy was involved with the Stanton Moor in Derbyshire um, camp campaign um, when they wanted to quarry into the edges of a sacred space on the moor, um, which as part of the sacred landscapes I've asked Amy if she'd talk to us about it. So welcome, Amy, and what can you tell us? Oh, hi, Steve. Thanks very much for having me here today. Yeah. Um, I don't know if people know about Stanton Moor up in Derbyshire. Mm. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful landscape. It is. Um, yeah, it's about one mile square, um, little piece of moorland that's got um, about 80 different sacred sites on there from sort of stone mm. circles to round uh, barrows and also rocky outcrops as well um so it's a very important time from the bronze age mm. um onwards really and um it's just i find it it's a very beautiful it's got mixed it's got the moorland sort of landscapes with the heather mm. it's got the woodlands with lots of beautiful silver birch trees and people are so very much attracted to that place and you know love going up there's it's really struck a chord mm. in many many people's um lives and hearts um and yeah it was definitely worth um you know protection in in lots of its different ways mm. Mm. so as i understand it because I, I know you'd written the book as well god in sacred sites by amy bleasborn and it was a friend of mine said this is, if you want to know about protests and protest sites this is a book you need to read and it, it is oh, a really kind. good book. Yeah, it's excellent. Um, I think you did it as part of your degree you were doing at the time. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right. So, um, yeah, in about 2009, I started a PhD mm. um, looking really at how to interpret sacred sites that would incorporate um, like the living landscape itself, not just interpreting them in a way of, oh, this was when the site was built, you know, it was used for these purposes, mm. which generally we don't know anyway so it's all conjecture yeah. in terms of archaeologists but so I was really trying to look at how we could try and incorporate people's use of sacred places mm. today which are so um, fluid and kind of a multitude really of different mm. ideas that are connected to them um, but what actually happened then at the time after doing a bit of research on um, nine mm. ladies and kind of seeing what was hap happening up there with the protest site um, I realized there was about a year left um, to of the protest site because it had actually won um, at that point, mm. um, but there was still like signatures to be um, signed, yeah, yeah. and the protesters were saying, "Well, we're not actually going to go until we know one hundred percent sure that you know that it's sorted that there will be no quarrying for sun, yeah. uh, sandstone here." So I thought actually this is a great opportunity to go to the protest site and mm. basically speak to the people who were living there and record the different ideas about it. Um, mm. And not just from the protesters, but from the villagers, from all the people that were involved, the landowners, the police, yeah. um, the other sort of agencies that were linked mm. and, and the locals, actually, because they were the guys that got the protesters there in the first place. Certainly the locals from the very next village, Stanton Lees. Um, so, yeah, it just seemed really a, an important time to, um, you know, record mm. that, that journey. Mm. really. Yeah, yeah. I think from from reading your book, it's there were two quarries there that had not been used for a little while, but they'd still got a time that they were granted to quarry, and they wanted yes. to quarry, and it was going to come very close to the nine ladies uh, circle that a lot of people who into the, into those things um, they they love the place as I do, and and the more itself as well as you said, all the other all the other uh, cairns and things around the area um so I, I know the i think the villagers were very against it yeah i think they were they were expecting to pull out something like three or you know in the initial application um it was something like 3.2 million tons worth of stone which is absolutely ridiculous and was definitely you know the the locals actually proved that the, that stone wasn't there so where they got that figure from i don't know but but yeah i think mm. um Initially, it was the the local village, so the one mm. directly next to where the, the quarries were going, which were saying, hang on a minute, these quarries haven't been used for sort of 50, 60 years. Um, and there should be, because it's in the Peak District as well, mm. 
there certainly should be um, some sort of law to protect this, really. Um, yeah. so, so they went out and um, actually got in, t- got in touch with some uh, of the protesters who were at Bazrek that was in Derby. And oh, right, some yeah. people were down there. Yes, yeah, yeah. I know. Um, and they connected with those guys. And then, mm. I guess, out went the word then mm. um, to lots of other different people. And, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people mm. came to help um you know a bit of a slow start but as the the years went on and i guess the pressure mounted as well and there was quite a few mm. high court battles to say whether it is actually um a disused quarry or a quarry that was still in use which of course it was mm. classified as disused in the end which was great and set then a precedent for other quarries in the yeah. local area to not yeah. um have this extended um kind of rights um, mm. that came after the war um, that weren't really relevant anymore, especially after then the Peak District was um, classified as an area that needed to be, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you know, maintained essentially. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, part of sacred earth activism that you know we're doing the video for, um, we're concerned with sacred landscapes and that all the land is sacred, not just although somewhere like. Um, Nine Ladies or Avebury and Arbolo in, and also in Derbyshire and all those places, they're all sacred in their own right, but then so could so could a, a special tree or a stream or a well or just somewhere that you go, a special place where you like mm-hmm. to go and be quiet and and so on. So I, I think it's it's important to recognise that everywhere is sacred, you know, and and I know with Nine Ladies it certainly is still used by a lot of people as a sacred place yeah i think you're right there you know landscapes take on meaning by <clears throat> sort of our um experiences that we have there mm. or you know our moods and things and i think um kind of we insert our ideas emotions and things into the landscape so mm. beautifully that i and totally agree um with you there when you're saying that everywhere is sacred and mm. um, i think uh, as a society there's definitely a movement towards sort of um eco activism now yeah. um people understanding the importance of going out there to sit with mm. a tree like you you said mm. um and yeah i think again on uh, on nine ladies we've got kind of like a a microcosm of mm. the world really there's so many different ideas that are attached to nine ladies from the fact that it's a private moorland where the landowner can mm. kind of do whatever he wants really uh, he, yeah. you know he can he can encourage quarrying um if that's what it's certainly in the past that's what mm. happened um to the more sort of spiritual connections that people have up there where mm. you know they feel a deep sense of peace and home um up there and they might go up to communicate with their ancestors or mm. um you know, have a sacred, a spiritual moment with themselves, maybe do yoga or, mm. or go up there for healing. I mean, it's got quite a few um, springs up there and that water is absolutely mm. delicious. And, you know, I think it's, it's that's a, that was actually on the side where the protest camp was, mm. which is one of the really good kind of features of that um, area yeah, and, and the site, yeah. really. Yeah, mm. you know, we had the wood from the trees we had to burn for, for heat and we had the water, which enabled a bit mm. you know the sustainability of the yeah. site really and um, but yeah there's so many different um you know ideas attached to it that's what i always found quite fascinating really and i think any piece of land has mm. that you know mm. um and it's creating it's, it's, it's i guess it's through that connection people had with nine ladies and other spaces um you know this is how i think we can try and protect um the spaces from development mm, yeah. although it's that is becoming much more difficult now with sort of the new laws that hopefully won't get through but they are yes absolutely yeah suggesting um yeah mm. i know there's the 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 new policing bill that would give people uh, the powers that be more power to move people on with you know not having so many restrictions on their power which mm. it seems to be a lot of people are against it so hopefully that won't that won't be passed and plus there's a lot of other sites there's the hs2 sites that we've seen including the ones in london and, and the tunnels that people had which actually reminded me of because you had uh, they had tunnels up at um the camp at stanton moor didn't they as well where people would go 
Yeah, so there was kind of like a whole massive web of defence really over mm. the two sites that was was split up by a road. Mm. Um, there was uh, lots of tree houses, um, and yeah, a, a, a quite quite a, a rabbit warren really of, of different trees yeah. that were going through yeah. the sites. And also the landscape really was quite beneficial in that sense. Like a few mm. people did make. Well, I guess there was tunnels already there, really. From if you imagine, mm. it was an old quarry site, so you had a lot mm. of the the heaps of stone that people mm. yeah, uh, yeah. would sort of create a, mm. a doorway into a, a a tunnel that was already there, really. Mm. Um, and you know, thankfully, uh, nobody had to go down the tunnels, or yeah. there was no eviction in the end. I think partly because of financial issues from the the landowner. Who was was that? Who actually seemed very? Um, he quite liked the idea, I think, of having a protest site on his land. He used to walk through the site and often would would knock on the treehouse's door and things and say hello to people. Oh, great! <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so that was uh, Edward Manners, and um, yeah, and and also probably because of the location and because of how it being quite far from the roads and mm. it wasn't very accessible really and it, it kind mm. of became a bit of a no-go area for the police um yeah it's so it seemed anyway which obviously the locals didn't mm. like very much um yeah. but because uh, uh, and also you you know you had that the whole thing with planning because it, we, we were coming up to a certain amount of years and people were worried that then we would have sort of residential status on that land mm. so that added more and more pressure yeah um to the protest site mm. um, you know and then you had the locals in stanton and peak saying oh well i wasn't allowed to put up a, a shed in my back garden but those guys over there have put up tree houses and <laughs> yeah, you know, not, yeah, yeah not quite comparable really <laughs> no no absolutely yeah it certainly felt reading the book that it was um there was a bit of a i don't know perhaps an uneasy alliance between the local people and the people in the camp because I know there were some people that certainly didn't want you all there, people, local villagers, but yeah. also realised that you're actually doing some, you're doing a lot of good. Yeah, I think it was all depending really on the location. So the, the villagers that were going to be right next mm. to the actual quarry mm. and therefore were next to the protesters were like, yep, keep going, do your best, you know, we are here for mm. you. And really supported the protesters. They, yeah. um, you know, would provide Sunday dinners. They'd provide um, water or um, power yeah, for yeah. people to charge their phones and batteries and things. Mm. But then the village that was further away from the quarry and the protest site were like, "Oh no, this is disgusting! You're you're disrupting the rural idyll." Um, interestingly mm. enough, hardly any police complaints were made. But then there mm. was this kind of real, I guess, moral panic against these kind of smelly dirty hippies coming and ruining our yeah. rural idyll mm. you know which was totally thrown down in the high court actually and said well none of it none of it could have happened you know there's no logs of, of these kind of antisocial behaviors that mm. was claimed um but again like quite an interesting kind of case study really of mm. um of those different ideas surrounding it and it wasn't really until the three villagers you know as in Stanton and Peak, Stanton mm. Lees and us was was that the mm. protesters were actually saying the same thing which was we're not quarrying here but you can quarry you know elsewhere yeah that is when things started to move forward then so when there was these conflicts between the groups yeah you know it was just it was just you know mm. hitting like hitting a, a brick wall essentially yeah um which again is is quite interesting really in terms of I guess trying mm. to reach consensus as villagers or, yeah. or you know as a community yeah. mm. before then mm. moving things forward because it was kind of a waste of time money effort and energy really the the kind mm. of these kind of interpersonal battles that went on kind of yeah. just below the surface with the planning permissions mm. and things um but interesting to write about nevertheless yeah i bet yeah so what was tell, tell us a little bit about what life was like on the camp when you were there anyway you know what 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 the the daily life is and maybe what impacts it had on your own life you know previously and afterwards yeah so i just moved on to the site at kind of like the last sort of year year and a half um to kind of really write about what was happening there talk to people interview different people um but then also get involved in taking everything down itself as well mm. um 
so I guess the first sort of six months was a bit of a waiting game really we were waiting to see what was going to happen we all knew in, our, in the back of our minds that it was coming and I guess sort of kind of preparing ourselves so people at that point were starting to think okay where where am I going to go next mm-hmm. um as well as attending the locals at Stanton Forum uh, meeting with other locals and the landowners, which was quite useful really to sort of get an idea of how um, how it was all going to move forward, but also to, to hear about the um, summer solstice celebrations and how that was going to be policed. Mm. I think a lot of the time for myself specifically, I just used to love being in such close contact with the, the top of the mall and then yeah and kind of go up there and uh, I guess meet loads of people who were drawn to that place from so many different backgrounds mm. um but you know the the conversations you'd have on a daily basis with people up there was was absolutely fascinating yeah um so I guess yeah that the, the kind of and you know we would have site meetings as well to kind of try and work mm. out some sort of exit strategy mm. um but I think as the time went on, really sort of going into the, the last six months of time up, up there, it became a lot more emotional um, for myself, even though mm. I'd only been there for a short period of time, but certainly mm. for the people who, were, we, you know, we were starting to say goodbye, really. And and people yeah. were, you know, we were having work parties coming over to help us and we were really getting kind of stuck in really to, yeah. to just taking away the things on the outsides. Mm um you know like the tree houses that weren't in use anymore we were starting mm. to think okay well if it's not being lived in we we know there's this kind of end date coming you know certain mm. certain things have been signed and yeah yeah um yeah it was just basically starting to think right where do we start what's the plan how do we take things away but remain defensive in some mm. ways as well so that we're not just kind of exposing the land just in case you know, so we still mm. had that element of suspicion, really. Mm. Um, but, yeah, like I say, it just started to get very emotional. We had lots of visitors coming to yeah. sort of say their goodbyes to the place and the yeah. different structures that were up there. Um, but when we were actually taking the different places down, it was really interesting to mm. work on the land. And then, you know, you get your mind gets so used to seeing certain mm. things in the landscape that, it, you know, it just becomes very natural with the with the benders yeah, yeah. and the tree houses and things. Um, and then, you know, we take it down it, and a lot of the places wouldn't take too long to take down, to be honest. They were empty and things. It was more the structural. Mm. And then you pop it in the back of the trailer and then sort of turn around and do that last look. And it was just absolutely beautiful to see and hear and feel a different space mm. you know like we had completely removed that sort of humanity out of that landscape again and you could hear yeah. different noises like a little stream that maybe you weren't aware well, of yeah, before yeah. you know or you, I don't know you were just I, I remember um, somebody taking some um, uh, rope off a tree and just almost feeling like the trees were just breathing a sigh of relief mm. And I think that was a really beautiful moment that kind of happened again and again. And it was all like, oh, this is the last time that this will be happening. This is the last time Mm. that, you know, we'll be having a fire in this spot. And um, so, yeah, it was it was very emotional. But, uh, you know, what a wonderful sort of opportunity to for us all, really, everyone that went there to be so close to such a beautiful landscape, um, Mm. you know, and, and create a home there. Yeah. I mean, some of the structures. That they had there because obviously quite a, there's quite a lot of them were up in the trees and they you had like walkways between the trees and things you that's know, with, right you know yeah. with the two ropes <clears throat> i saw a picture of one was it a caravan up in a tree yeah the beast that's <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. and there was there that's... was quite a few um different sort of bits going on in that area um, yeah and there was there was a tunnel mm. there as well and kind of you know trying to create distractions um yeah. And, and things um yeah yeah it was it was very um i guess it, because the prototype was there for so long there was a lot mm. of opportunity i think it was 10 years mm. um, there was a lot of opportunity for people to come and kind of put their their stamp mm. on it really um and get involved as much as they wanted to did they ever get people who came there perhaps for not the wrong reasons shall i say you know who just wanted to 
party or not there's anything wrong with partying but you know people who weren't there really to save a sacred space but were just there because it was a camp and because it was an alternative lifestyle um yeah i guess there was that element of it but i think the thing about probably spaces like that is they are on the fringes of society and for whatever Mm. reasons these people you know feel attracted to it and maybe need to escape their own reality for a bit Mm. I would always hope that it would be quite a grounding experience for people to I guess get back to basics and kind of Mm. interact with um, the different protesters I always felt it was very much a vibe of we don't care what's happened in the past with you we don't care what what's kind of gone on in your past it's what we're we are doing now that's important yeah and that was that seemed like the kind of big like a mindfulness I guess Mm. that um in terms of welcoming people in Mm. um that okay you're here now let's do this together but yeah I do think there was definitely that element um Mm. but hopefully those people went away with you know like Mm. I say some sort of grounding Mm. maybe a bit of healing because yeah if they're drinking that water if they're sort of immersing themselves in that kind of space yeah um, I guess I guess in the last year there wasn't that many new incomers no you know while I was there it was more I guess people mm. were leaving really more than coming mm. <laughs> yeah yeah um, so I, you know I can't really wouldn't say I could necessarily no. answer no. that question <laughs> it, it, it must I mean people must have formed some quite emotional strong relationships over the, the time they were there especially the people who were there for from the beginning yeah and there was quite a few yeah Yeah, there was quite a few that were there from right from the beginning all the way through and you know they had that initial when they moved there in say I don't know 2000 and you know the idea was that it was always going to be a very temporary thing and then each year that went on oh you know I won't plant any seeds I won't plant a garden for the next summer because we Mm. aren't we probably get evicted we won't be here so there's always this real transient uh, temporary nature but Mm. I think um, a friend of mine who lived up there said to me, um, after about four years of being like, no, I'm not going to plant any, she then decided, no, this year I'm going to plant them. She had six years worth of uh, oh, growing good. then. <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's quite interesting, really, that kind of idea of being somewhere yeah. temporary. I guess and... that's sort of a, yeah, I guess that's sort of a, a transient nature of the, of the camp and what was happening there. Yeah. I guess it could either be... I guess it, for some people it could be it could be worrying that you know what's mm. going to happen, but I guess in other ways it could be quite freeing as well. Mm. The fact that you know all the other things that aren't so important don't matter anymore. You know what matters is what we're doing here. Yeah, that was yeah. is definitely the understanding I got. Yeah, a lot of the people up there didn't define themselves as as pagans at all when when I spoke to people um, in mm. that last year. But I saw them as they were eco, they were pagan eco warriors. That was my understanding of what they yeah, did. Yeah. The fact that they yeah. were willing to put their life aside mm. for this amount of time for these trees, you know, this landscape yeah. for the locals, for other people mm. that want to come to the Peak District to enjoy that place. Mm. I mean, yeah. that kind of mentality. I don't know. You know, obviously, I lived there for a year. I was living in, in a bus. We had, you know, a fair amount of luxury in some ways, um, but. I don't know if I could personally deal with that temporary nature. I kind of like the my roots in a home. So, mm. you know, massive respect to people that that can do that. You know, yeah. like you say, it must take some immense um, guts, really. Yeah, of course. There's, there's similar things happening down um, with the road expansion around near Stonehenge, you know, with the camp there and people trying to stop the tunnel going ahead. It, it must be, I guess, having the... The friendship and camaraderie of sitting around the fire and being very almost feeling like a part of a family there mm. you know uh, living there rather than thinking I'm coming here for a few weeks this is where you live you know yeah and um, it's just much more of a simple way of life as well you know really yeah. your day jobs are things like well I need to collect wood so that I've got the fire I need to collect some water mm. I think that's what nine ladies really I guess for me it just slowed down mm life in terms of just yeah looking for those basics you know what are we going to eat can we do some foraging to you know for the berries or so there's some beautiful wood sorrel around uh, mm. nine ladies and other kind mm. of wild 
things and and you know there was uh, roadkill people would often yeah eat that as well so it just gets you I guess seeing life in a very very different way and perhaps something a bit mm. more authentic to I guess like when people were building Nine Ladies or Stonehenge you know yeah very much yeah. more land based well, yeah, yeah. And, and also nature really dictated what activities or things we'd get up to mm. I remember that I think it was about f- three months left on the protest site and the the snow came and it came for about mm. four weeks or so and you know not just a little bit of snow I mean this was sort of yeah, yeah. a good couple of foot you know peak mm. district mm. So, and it did stop play but it started play as well in the same way we couldn't mm. uh, necessarily go up the trees to collect stuff but we found that using car bonnets to put bits of wood on then we could use it as a sledge and basically pull <laughs> pull loads of stuff down the hills uh, yeah i could imagine <laughs> and sledging be, in itself yeah, I bet that was quite fun as well yeah to do, yeah it I mean, was yeah. so just having yeah interestingly you know and, and when it was raining so nature really impacted everything that we like it does to a certain extent you know if you're living in the house and things but it was it was even mm. more so really you know mm. Um, so it was fascinating in that sense. Yeah, I guess you certainly you were more susceptible to the to the whims of nature and whether you know what yeah. it was like and what you could do. I mean, now um, you can go out in a car or public transport or whatever, mm-hmm. and you don't have to think I'm not going to be able to go there today because there's snow on the ground or it's you know there's a really strong wind blowing. Which mm-hmm. I guess in the trees it must have been. I think somebody, I think you, somebody said. Um, something about it almost rocking them to sleep when it was yeah. windy in the trees and it was swaying. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, in the yeah. book. Yeah, someone said that. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. Total respect for the people that were living up in those trees. You know, some of them were really high up, mm. and and the sort of architecture of the um, stuff was quite fascinating as well. Like and like you say, the um, the kind of network or, or sort of web of um, ropes and things in the tree down on bottom side mm. um where there was kind of like then a seat in the middle of this yeah web, um this was very very fascinating and i think also then those the protesters being there created an idea up nine ladies on on top of the moor where the stone circle is where people were visiting irrespective really of the protest mm. side but it, it certainly impacted the way that people were viewing nine ladies and well it certainly mm. did for me I, I remember going up to nine ladies in 2000 and I knew there was a protest like there. I've been told when I was up there and it kind of created this oh wow well what what you know what are people protesting for and this must mm. be a very very special part of yeah. land you know mm. and even though like you say every bit of land is sacred mm. and should be protected and celebrated um it really just emphasized this is a very special piece of land and what is it you know and that's what started my fascination Mm. really why are these people here why are people wanting to to quarry here in the first place you know um how could that even be it's such a beautiful landscape so um yeah i Mm. think it set people's minds possibly looking at places in a different way Mm. and then you know if you drive around the peak district i mean it's full of holes um, yeah. Some are absolutely mm. devastating um, to see and, you know, to be around. Um, and maybe it got people thinking about that in a different way as well. Mm. I guess it maybe it made people be to be more mindful of mm. the land they were walking through rather than just walking through it, being really aware of, you know, these trees are here, these stones are here. What happens if they're not? What will it look like? You know, we can't get mm. them back. You know, if once they're gone, they're gone. Mm. You know, so yeah, that's it, a really good point. Yeah, it sounds that um, sounds as if the it was quite a good, um, quite a good thing going on between yourselves and nature. In that mm. you said that the tree seems as if it when they took the, the, the structure out of it, it's almost as if the tree breathed, but it actually tolerated you all being there and maybe in some extent welcome you being there because you were doing something to save the place yeah you know i think i think so working with nature would certainly be a lot better way of of going forward than trying to use use nature Mm, definitely and um 
you know, big respect to all the people that are at the Stonehenge camp at the moment. Mm. Um, hoping to get down there soon to yeah. visit everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's still going on. This is the thing, isn't it? You think, mm. you know, it's great that um, nine ladies, there was kind of, the battle was kind of won. I mean, there was a compromise, essentially. They, they decided that, um, you know, the, 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 the quarries that we were protesting against were dormant, so they couldn't continue to have planning permission for there. Um, but they did, unfortunately, just move across the road and extended one that, OK, yes, it's a much less sensitive site. It's not next to the moor as such, but it's still mm. only, you know, 500 metres from, from the other site. I did um, see another quarry site when I when I went up there last week, mm. the week before, um, and I usually go up from the the what you might call the main entrance to the moor, where most people know. Um, but this time I went round the other side, uh, the other side, and walked up the hill through the woods, um, oh. and I saw a quarry that was in looked a fairly small place, but a, a quarry that was actually in use then. So maybe that's that's it. Mm, yeah mm. I mean the, it's quite ironic really because really the moor itself has been uh, an, uh, it's been used for quarrying for hundreds of years uh, uh, really I think it's in the book there's a there's an image of the moor like an apple core and on the mm. top you've kind of got nine ladies and then all round yes. the, the top there mm. it's been sort of dug into by the quarry manufacturers and it's quite an interesting it's ironic in the sense that that now those disused quarries are actually have actually become a very beautiful habitat, you mm. know, and kind of create our experience of what Nine Ladies and Stanton Moor is like now. You know, yeah. it creates these different sort of micro landscapes, which is absolutely um, beautiful now. But mm. of course, back in the day when we would have seen them, it would have been absolutely awful. Yeah, um, it but, doesn't um, take long for nature to reassert itself once humans leave it alone and go away it doesn't take long for exactly things to grow back again which is which is good yeah, yeah and just and also the devastation that the quarrying did cause to the archaeological sites up there you mm. know first off you've got the um antiquarians who came and kind of took everything out of the sites themselves and mm. you know dug them up and, and damaged quite a large proportion up stand up on stanton moor including mm. the nine ladies um and then you know the quarries came and basically took a lot down themselves and didn't really mm. care that, that, that they were in the way. Thankfully, that can't happen now with the protection with English heritage, but although, yeah. or can it? Because, you know, you've got down at Stonehenge, yeah. which is English just proving that, yeah, that there's a yeah. World Heritage site there that's that's bigger than just the stones themselves, mm. yet they think it's acceptable Absolutely. to dig, to dig mean, a massive tunnel, which is The, the site goes across to further into Avebury and all over the plains and there's so many beautiful barrows and the King's Barrow and things and the old King's Barrow and mm. lovely lovely places and very mm. spiritual feeling to the places as well yeah um, I think there's to me yeah, you can feel that it's been used for special things whatever those things were it's you know it's uh, certainly something that, that that's worth preserving and it's not just the tunnel that they want to put under Stonehenge. It's also um, the fact that the tunnel is not very deep um, and they're going to have to dig up massive amounts of the, the, the plain, Salisbury Plains and everything around there for making compounds and access roads to build it. It's not just, well, they're just going to move that road a bit over there. Mm. It's going to have a, and every time they do any digging, they, they're finding more remains, more things. It's, exactly. One yeah. of the most important sites in the world, mm. and they want to do this to it. It's just incredible. Yeah. yeah, you just wouldn't think it would be able to happen. I mean, Stonehenge has kind of left to the people, really, and an English heritage have kind of took it up, but yeah. they aren't doing a very good job of protecting it, in my opinion. No, they're not. they're not. And, you know, the restricting access, I think it's absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Um, you know, we sh it should be a free site to whoever wants yeah. to go and managed, you know, managed in a respectful way for the different people that want to use it and view it yeah. and interact yeah. with, with that space. You know, it can yeah. be done. We've just got to think outside the box, I think, in terms of mm. the management side of things. Yeah. You know, I don't necessarily agree with loads of people having, you know, a party and not respecting the, the archaeology. Mm. Um, I think that respect can be taught. I think it's all about education. You know, and, yeah. and trying to create um, interpretation that mm. 
you know, stories around the landscape that can inform us about our behaviour, you know, mm. just like was done in, in the ancient times and things. I think mm. we really need to almost go back to go forward. Yeah. I think it's it links into some extent with what we were talking about, um, Nick Hayes and his book of Trespass, mm. and about so much of the land is is locked away from you know we we can't go in it or we're not supposed to do um and people worry about well if they if they change this anybody can come walking into my back garden or you know all over my farmland and that's not what it's about at all you know it's other countries scotland i think has a much um more advanced way of looking at this in that most places are open for access certainly far more than we have you know mm, yeah yeah this is it i'm um, santa more actually get, just going back to that was um <clears throat> it's only been enclosed for about 200 years mm. um and before the enclosures act up there um so the enclosure mm. committee came to mark out the space of enclosure for stanton more but they were actually met by a mob uh with holding sort of forks and pickaxes right, and yeah. things and told to go and never come back because you are not taking this piece of land from our community because it was a common Santa Moore yeah. was just 200 years ago mm. um but unfortunately I think as time passed whether those that mm. generation had gone um and that that passion wasn't there they did get enclosed in the end but then of yeah. course as the enclosures came in that was then when the destruction of the site started to happening not just like like I mentioned the uh, antiquarians mm. who were digging up the sites and mm. you know damaging them you know massively um but also the quarrying itself so you know people think oh the enclosures you know it created private property which meant people were uh, protecting these spaces more well not on Stanton Moor that was not the case at all it's led to no. more devastation mm. And unfortunately, a lot of people worry now now about uh, visitors to Santa Moore and how they're impacting, mm. uh, especially at the summer solstice. It does attract quite a lot of um, visitors um, during the, that period of time. Partly, mm. I think, because Stonehenge became so controlled yeah. and people wanted to have an experience of kind of wilderness. And <clears throat> Santa Moore gives that a little bit of an illusion because it's away from the main mm. road and things. Um, th there is a big problem with litter up there. Um, yeah. Um, during that sort of period of time, um, so me and a group of uh, some of my friends have set up the um, Guardian Sacred Sites network. Mm. Um, it was basically set up last year because somebody went up to Doltor, another little circle down from Nine. Mm, I know it. Yeah. Yeah, below Stanton Moor, mm. and uh, rearranged some of the stones. Um, and I was try wondering if I needed to report it, if it had been reported at all, but found out that people didn't, although it had been spread all over social media, nobody had actually reported it to the Peak District. Right. So then I set up this group and made sort of flyers and posters and telling people how to report different mm. things so that the archaeologists can go back then and kind of put it back to how it was originally yeah. Um, yeah. placed. Um, and since then, we've been doing loads of litter picks probably about once a month. Yeah. Um, and generally kind of keeping in touch people sending in images uh, of any damage or litter mm. so that other people can potentially go up and you know pick the site up and I think it's it's really helping we've got locals mm. involved and mm. pagans other other sort of people mm. um so yeah that's moving forward quite nicely and we're hoping to get in touch with the landowner although he seems a bit he doesn't really want to, well, my understanding is that he doesn't necessarily want to promote the site and sees anything like that as a kind of promotion. Mm. Um, but what we're trying to say is it's about education, actually. You know, we want to make sure there's a group of people mm. up there, um, really at all times, you know, yeah. to kind of educate and mm. help people understand why not only this part of the land, but, you know, why nature is important full stop yeah. you know and, and what how we can care for it because that kind of understanding seems to have shifted on a little bit for us mm. nowadays people I mean, when I was growing up in the 80s you know oh you would never dare drop litter that was just no, not done no. <laughs> mm. um, but I guess we've become more of a throwaway society there is just generally more yeah. litter more plastics um, mm. so yeah just trying to get that message across really and to have a presence during the solstice yeah. which is generally left 
you know people to just get on with what they want to do mm. it's not really policed as such there is yeah. police there sometimes but um mm. but yeah just to give people an idea of of you know mm. why it's so important to us and to, yeah. to everybody really it's good to know that there are still people guarding sites like this and i'm sure there are similar things at other places you know mm. and there's nothing stopping anybody if there's a a local site that's special to you not necessarily a sort of a sacred as in a holy site it could be all sorts of things as we said but if there's something there mm. there's nothing stopping a group of people protecting it i know a lot of little villages and towns um at the moment of, that, that i know have started out getting doing regular litter picks with local yes. people yeah um, i mean it would be better if people didn't drop the litter in the first place but at least there are people there trying to help if it happens you know yes um, absolutely i totally and, as you said I, I never would have dreamt of and i would i don't now as, as a child of dropping litter and i was taught that you respect nature you shut gates and why you have to shut gates because of livestock and things and that you don't drop litter and well, well what do you think is going to happen to that piece of mm. that plastic cup you've dropped on the floor you know so um oh, people that even just Sometimes I just take a plastic bag in my rucksack when I go for a walk somewhere and if yeah. I see bits of litter, collect it, take it in, drop it in a bin, you know, everything helps. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea and, and almost getting that into our minds now. If we're going for a walk, take a bag, take a, a glove or whatever, mm. just so that if it's there and kind of be mm. a bit more mindful of the idea that, OK, we don't want to see rubbish around these beautiful places in nature but you know it is there potentially and if we all helped and did our little mm. bit like that um it would soon go down and also yeah trying to ed ed education i think <clears throat> isn't it? i think there needs to be a concerted effort really through mm. um you know local local authorities and mm. um the government really it just doesn't seem to be tying their, their agenda they're more about destruction and devastation aren't they mm. really, unfortunately so, so it's down to the people i think yeah absolutely yeah i think people it's getting people to realize that it's it's their land yeah no matter what legalities say or the enclosures mm -hmm. and things it really is a community's land in their mm -hmm. area um and to be perhaps be more involved in some ways with it and realizing it's their land and thinking well no i'm not going to accept people doing this to this land it's wrong yeah and the definitely. stanton moore thing has certainly showed what a group of people who were dedicated dedicated parts of their lives in fact to protecting mm. it um what they can do i mean when i was up there the other week i was talking to an old uh, gentleman um the only other person i saw that day and he, he was talking about what happened in those times he lives on the other side of the valley as he put it uh, towards darley dale and he said that um talking about the protest camp he said yeah they did a good job of protecting this place he said there were a few people that weren't too sure but and they told us that when they moved when they left they would leave no trace and he said and they made a really good job of that as well he said you can't tell nature's taken over and you can't tell there was ever um a protest camp or any kind of camp there so no and that's great to hear when yeah. we did a, a final walk around the site with the peak district park and the landowners mm. and the police they actually said the peak district park authority representative said um this is probably the cleanest part of the peak district right now you know because we went through you know with a yeah. fine tooth comb with with um magnets you know large magnets just making sure we got every single bit of anything wow yeah and, it, and what a total honor that was as well mm. you know it was devastating then to go back in the summer of that year to then find that somebody had just left all their camping gear on one of the sites that we'd cleaned oh. um you know but but obviously we tidied that back up and mm. uh, just a, a constant fight but no um i think that was the thing we did we did say we were going to leave it was very difficult to leave but we did mm. do it <laughs> yeah In so the end. how do people access this um guardian sacred sites i know you've got a facebook page haven't you is there any any other places um yeah it's all on all the major sort of um sales places on amazon although i wouldn't don't want to necessarily advertise for Amazon. No, yeah. Um, but yeah if you type it into google it comes up with quite a few different options there where you can buy it from uh, yeah. guarding sacred sites and um, the nine ladies antiquary campaign 
Mm. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoy. This should be another book coming out fairly soon. And we're, oh, we've also been creating um, some uh, meditations based on Nine Ladies. Oh wow! Um, on a on a YouTube site with my friend Cheryl yeah um, on a YouTube page called you are me so it's y-o-u capital r m e mm. um and yeah we've got a couple up there different um I guess inter- our interpretations and that then become a meditation um, so mm. the people we, we actually made it during the last lockdown um because we really wanted to i certainly wanted to go up I, you know i wasn't allowed living living too far away nowadays mm. <laughs> um and so we thought well it would be great to create kind of a, a a place in our minds where we can go and visit so yeah there's a couple of bits on that youtube page that you can go and That's visit good. Um, that are all sort of nine ladies related some prayers also to the Stonehenge activists that are there mm. right now um, just sending love out really from the nine ladies yeah well I'm sure they'll be very very happy about that they're a wonderful bunch of people mm. as I'm sure you all were back in the old days <laughs> <laughs> back in my day <laughs> yeah yeah so right well is there anything else you wanted to talk about, Amy, today? Or um, anything I think that's about everything, Steve, yeah. Okay, well, that's been really good to talk with you. And oh, I'm sure people, you. when they watch this video, um, will enjoy it as much as I've done. Oh, so, thank you very Amy, much. Great to talk to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.